Shabbat Shalom. So as many of you know, when, uh, when I'm in the car a lot, as I have been these last couple weeks, uh, I get to listen to books a lot or podcasts. And so I've been listening to uh, the book Bomber Mafia by Malcolm Gladwell. Anybody read Bomber Mafia? Listen to it. Yeah. So it's a, it's a, as Malcolm Gladwell's books are, it's filled with stories and um, unknown facts. It's, but it's quite disturbing about the way in which World War II uh, played out uh, and how uh, we came to win the war. Uh, and at one point he's very focused on uh, Air Force General LeMay who was uh, at one time in charge of the, uh, the Western Front, uh, in charge of the, the war in the Pacific, and who really is known for managing the campaign of, of bombing Japan. And LeMay was uh, had looked up to a World War I general, General Stilwell, and, it, and he had always wanted their paths to cross, and eventually he, uh, their paths crossed a couple times, and LeMay sat with Stilwell, his, um, in some ways, an idol or a, um, a mentor for him, and, and wanted to explain to him this new innovation of aerial warfare and how impressive it was for uh, the American ability to win these world wars. And so one night, they stay up all night with General LeMay trying to convince General Stilwell of how, uh, how amazing it is that you can fly planes and fight your enemy without putting troops on the ground. And after staying up all night, General Stilwell still doesn't get it. He can't understand, because he comes from a previous generation that fought in World War I, he can't understand, and he had gone to West Point, and was trained in, uh, in warfare on the ground. He can't understand how you would fight a war from the air. That's just not how war works. Until the end of the war, when the Japanese surrender, the two men are invited to stand on the shores of Japan. And he looks out and he can see the destruction, uh, the mass destruction that was caused by these bombs in the air. And he says, uh, he says to General LeMay, I understand now, but prior to this, it was just beyond my imagination. And I want to sit with that thought for a moment because I think it's telling of no matter how much we want somebody to understand something, sometimes there are some things that are simply beyond what we can imagine could be true, and until we see it with our own eyes, we won't believe it. The Torah portion this week is, we're getting well into Deuteronomy, where Moses is retelling the story uh, in his own words. And it starts with these images of idealism, these promises. God will favor you and bless you and multiply you, blessing the issue from your womb and your produce from the soil. No one will be infertile. You'll have unnumbered livestock. There'll be no illness, no sickness among you, no diseases, and all of your enemies will lose to you. We read these words sometimes and we say, well, this is, this is an empty promise. It's impossible. You can't promise somebody that everything's just going to be perfect. But what if we think of it a different way? Not that this is literally what would happen, but what if it is that as you enter into this new place and you're about to cross over the Jordan River, you can't imagine what will happen. You can't see the goodness that will come. And so I'm going to try and paint a picture for you, but I know you're not going to believe it. No matter what I say, you won't understand what the future could look like until you see it yourself. But know that there could be some amazingly wonderful, good things that happen down the road. In a book of stories by Sidney Greenberg, there's an anonymous quote that reads, some minds are like concrete, all mixed up and permanently set. And as we grow older, it's very tempting to develop a permanent mindset. 
But mines, like parachutes, are valuable only when opened. If we look back through history, I think in some ways we could say it's easy to list the things that were unimaginable, but that today we take for granted. Solving the AIDS crisis or polio or the innovations that we have in communication or in travel, to say that you could in, uh, in one moment talk to somebody uh, on a screen who's across the world as if they were sitting right in front of you. Not many years ago, people would say unimaginable, impossible. Uh, even I remember the days when uh, cell phone calls were $1.25 a minute and you didn't make them. So I want to paint for you, I want to share with you uh, one of the joys that I get to have by being at camp. Because in many ways, uh, camp is the most idealistic space we have. Uh, and the privilege that I get to be there means that in, I believe I, I get to see the future that the rest of us don't get to see yet. So here was my first day at camp. It's my favorite image uh, from my last two weeks. Uh, I sit down in a space not so different than this. It was a prayer space, except it was in the round, and so you're sitting across from other people. And of course, it's camp benches, not nice chairs. And I don't know any of the campers yet. It's day one. The first camper is sitting on the bench, a young boy with a Black Hawks shirt on, because most of the kids are from Chicago. Sitting next to him is a camper that's clearly transgender who I later found out prefers the use of the pronoun they. Next to that, that camper is uh, a camper from Uganda. Some of you may know that there's a small Jewish tribe that was discovered uh, about 20 years ago in Uganda. One of the members of that tribe is now in rabbinical school in New York, and her daughter joined us at camp this summer. So we've got Black Hawk shirt, transgender camper, black camper from Uganda. Then there was the head counselor of the unit, also transgender. Then there was a camper with purple hair, half shaved off, wearing headphones. I say wearing headphones because headphones aren't allowed at camp, except if you need an accommodation because camp is loud, camp is busy, camp is anxiety filled and so there are some campers who have accommodations where when it gets loud they can put headphones on and so this girl was wearing her headphones and finally there was an Israeli camper because there were a number of campers who came over from Israel who were part of reform congregations in Israel so here you have on one bench what some of us might say is a lot of the colors of the rainbow and to many of us I think we would say if we were to think of that in our congregations today, that might be a little unimaginable. Not because we're bigoted or racist or homophobic, but just because we don't think that that's what our congregations are going to look like. But I would tell you that not a, a eye was looking or sound was made or any sort of difference was noticed. This is just how the next generation is. This is normal to them. This is how they live life. And these kids weren't all grouped together because they were different. They just, if I would have been looking at a different bench, it would have been a different group of the rainbow uh, of colors. And so I, I think it's a decent image of what being Jewish will look like in the future. This is how our kids are growing up. It's how they're comfortable. It's how they see their Judaism. It is the place where they can feel most themselves, whoever that self is. I'll close with a brief story. Um, it's from the tradition of Chelm. Some of you may know the stories from Chelm. They're, they're, uh, they're intended to be uh, unrealistic and a bit of a farce, but to have somewhat of a moral at the end. And so the story is that a teacher asks uh, two students, uh, do you know which way do you grow? Do you grow from your feet up or from the head down? The first student says, well, I know for a fact that you grow feet up because I just bought my son a bar mitzvah suit six months ago 
and it came time for his bar mitzvah, and this, the pants were too short. So clearly you grow feet up. To which the other student says, absolutely not, I'm certain that you grow head down because every time I see people walking, their feet are on the same level, but their heads are at different heights. So clearly you grow head up. To which the teacher gives the moral of the story. The truest measure of growth is not head up, head down or feet up, but rather inside out. We grow most when we go out into the world, become aware of the lives of brothers and sisters of other people, and realize that that's the direction in which we grow by noticing exactly how different we are and how much we have to learn from other people. And so, there are unimaginable things in our future. I think some of them are going to be amazing. I feel very lucky I got to see some of them, and Alex is going to see some of them. And then uh, some of those people will grow up to marry each other, like the Pinskys, because I think they met at camp, right? How old? You were, how old were you when you met at camp? Ten. Ten. <laughs> see? Unimaginable. <laughs> He proposed right there. <laughs> and here they are. <laughs> so for all the unimaginable things in our future that could be great blessings, uh, I hope we get to see them in our lifetime. And I hope we can remain optimistic as there are things we can't imagine that will, in fact, be beautiful for us. Shabbat shalom. We'll turn to page 282.